Good evening, everyone. I'm Wendell Jones, and welcome to this edition of The Platform. On this program, we examine national and sometimes international issues. And on our program tonight, we are going to be dealing with both, because we are going to be talking about the economy. And uh, our guest is going to talk about three economic myths that is about us, that are about us. And uh, we are going to examine whether or not these myths are there or not. And uh, he is a guest in the Bahamas of the Nassau Institute. And the Nassau Institute provides the platform a number of distinguished guests from time to time. And it's our pleasure to have on our program today Dr. Stephen Horitz, who is a Charles A. Dana Professor of Economics at St. Lawrence University in New York. He is the author of two books, Micro Foundations and Macro Economics. An Austrian Perspective, Routledge 2000, and Monetary Evolution, Free Banking and Economic Order, uh, that is Westview, that is 1992, and he has written extensively on Austrian economics, monetary theory, history, and the economics and social theory of gender and family. He is a member of uh, many societies, and there is a uh, society here that I'm going to let you let him tell you about. Uh, he completed his MA and PhD in economics at George Mason University and received his AB in economics and philosophy from the University of Michigan. Professor Horitz is a huge pro hockey fan, especially his beloved Detroit Red Wings. Professor, welcome to our program. Thank you. It's good to be here. Godfrey Innes, you a hockey fan? I watch it. I've seen it. You've seen, seen it. it. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not, a, not too much of a fan. So why are you a Detroit Red, Red Wings? Well, I grew up in the Detroit area, and uh, there, I mean, the Red Wings have, have uh, been sort of the, Detroit's a big hockey town, and the Red Wings are the pro team, and now I live in a place that's cold, where hockey's a big sport, especially at the college level, Okay. so I still follow it very closely. These three economic myths that you, uh, you're going to address um, this week uh, at the British Colonial Hilton on Wednesday evening, you're speaking uh, to members of the Nassau Institute and members of the general mm -hmm. public. Tell us about the myths. Well, there's three that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the three are, first, that the uh, standard of living has, for most Americans, at least most North Americans, has declined over the course of the 20th and into the 21st century. So that's one myth I'm going to, going to talk about. Second myth that I'm going to talk about is the claim that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And then the third myth that I'll be talking about will be this, the idea that women make uh, uh, 74 cents on every, for every dollar that men make. And so those three will, that'll keep me busy, I think, for for a little while. Well, let me attack you on the first one. Sure. Isn't it true that the cost of living is higher now than ever before? No, nope, it, it isn't. And it depends how you want to talk about it. It's certainly true that when we look at goods and services, you know, we see higher prices on them than we have in the past. And, uh, but some of that is inflation, of course, right? That, uh, you know, almost all the economies of sort of the Western world have suffered from inflation. So we have to take into account, well, sure, goods cost more, but people have higher incomes than they did before as well. So at one level, when we look at sort of incomes compared to, to those prices, that, that those increasing prices don't mean what they seem to mean. But I actually think that's not the real deep issue. The real deep issue is if we want to understand how much things cost, we need to think in terms of how much labor does it take for people to purchase those goods. Because our labor time, our work time, is ultimately the most precious commodity we have. And so part of what I'm going to talk about on Wednesday night, there's a whole line of research that sort of says, let's look at how, mu how, much, how many hours or how many minutes of labor it would have taken at, at, a, at the average wage, say, 50 years ago, to buy some good, and then compare that to today. So for example, if a pair of pants, let's say, cost $20 uh, 25 years ago and cost, let's say, $40 today, okay? So we want to say, oh, well, the price is double. But if people's average wage has gone up more than double, right, then those, those 
pants today are actually cheaper in terms of the labor time it takes to buy them. And when we start to look at all kinds of goods and services, we find that, that almost, not everything, but almost everything is significantly cheaper in terms of, of measured in terms of those labor hours. But the fact of the matter is that uh, a lot of people are not getting increases in salary. And, yep. and the, the, the cost of doing business, yep. higher than ever before. Yep. Uh, the cost of goods and services, higher than ever before. Well, especially when you uh, take into consideration that the cost of energy is so high. Yeah, and, and certainly w if we look, it depends on the time frame we're looking at too. Over the, certainly over the last few years, gas prices have been were up and down a bit, then back up again. But if you look over the longer haul, and again, you sort of do this calculation, how much, for example, how many hours of work does it take to buy a gallon of gasoline, it's actually the long-term long trend uh, is, is lower. Uh, it's true, the cost of doing business in many ways, and often regulations being a huge part of that, are, are much higher. But most of the average goods that people buy, are, again, are, are actually cheaper in terms of labor time. And the reason is, even though we haven't seen tremendous increases in salary, we've seen tremendous decreases in prices on things like technology, even if you look, well, certainly technology is the most obvious, uh, but even food, though food prices have been up in the last year or two. Again, if you look over the course of the last, say, 25 or 50 years, in terms of the hours it takes to purchase those goods at the average wage, never been cheaper. On the technology side, just as an example, right, on the technology side, uh, in the United States in the early 1960s, you could have bought, it would have cost you about $500 to buy the sort of top of the line home stereo theater system, which wasn't very good as you can imagine in the 1960s. That $500, if you sort of represent, first of all, today for $500, you can go into the store and buy yourself a nice LCD TV and maybe even a sound system to go with it much better than you could have bought uh, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago. But more interestingly, if you say, how many hours would the average person have to have worked to purchase that $500 stereo system, right? And you say, okay, if they work that many hours today, what could they buy? Well, today, for that same number of hours at the higher wage, they could buy the LCD TV, they could buy the speaker system, they could buy a computer, an iPod, I mean, just the whole range of things. Mm. So the fact that, in fact, over time, wages have gone up, and at this, well, at the same time, uh, the prices of many goods have come down, thanks to innovation and competition, means that for many goods, um, uh, prices have never, have never been cheaper, measured in terms of labor time. Now, again, as you note, there's some exceptions, and certainly, the recession and the problems of the last few years have reversed some of those trends. But the long-term trend for, for, for uh, North America, Western Europe, is certainly for those, most of those prices to fall. Dr. Holmes, <clears throat> labor has been the primary reason, in my opinion, for the redistribution of wealth. And is the reason why your country is reinventing its economy. Because all along Pennsylvania, Ohio, we used to have industries. All those industries have now moved. Yeah. Where? To China, yeah, many to Bangladesh, mm -hmm. to, to, to India, and elsewhere. So labor does have a, have a factor. And, 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 yeah. and, and, and the, the, the reason why things are caused, not because of labor in your country, but because of labor yeah. in these countries that I mentioned. That's, and that's and that is what is given, that, and that is what is given importance and wealth to a, country, to a company like Walmart. Well, that's who right. Who buys all of the stuff yep. outside of America. Right. And, but notice, right, that process is mutually beneficial, right? We, as American consumers, we benefit from those lower prices. Yeah, when but it's been able responsible for the distribution of wealth. Well, but let's think it through, right? We, there's two distributions we might talk about here. First of all, the fact that we have outsourced those jobs to those places has made folks in those countries much wealthier than, exactly. they, than they used to be, right? But at the same time, in the United States, it's true that we that those jobs that those industrial jobs in those in the Midwest are not there the way they used to be. It's also true that that not all of those workers have sort of seen their their real incomes fall. Many of them have been able to retrain and retool and to pick up jobs either in the service sector or in the information but, but, sector. But what has also happened because of that outsourcing, and you and I spoke about it earlier, yeah. the changing demographics of.